Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name, 888-589-8840. Here's the number to call, 888-589-8840. Again, that website, if you want to get more information about Scott Lively's uh, candidacy for Governor of Massachusetts, Lively for Governor, I believe it's dot .com. Let me double check. Yeah, Lively for Governor uh, dot .com. Now, I mean, you know, today is St. Patrick's Day. Talked with Scott Lively about marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. 888-589-8840. Again, is that number 888-589-8840. And there truly was a St. Patrick, and he was a true saint. Bill Federer has a daily update called the American Minute. It's a great read. Encourage you to sign up for it. Go to his website, AmericanMinute.com. Come right into your inbox. And Patrick grew up in the country of England, and the Romans were guarding his community there in Britain. But you had the invasion of the Goths and the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths and the Vandals and the Huns. So all the Roman army got pulled out of Britain to go back to Rome to defend against the Huns, and and they finally couldn't do it. They finally Rome finally fell in 476 A.D. So Britain was left unguarded by the Romans, and Patrick was kidnapped by these marauders, and he was sold into slavery to the country of Ireland. Now, Ireland was run at this time by the Druids, and these Druids practiced human sacrifice. And so Patrick was there for about six years. He was a slave of a Druid chieftain. And during that time, God began to draw Patrick's heart to himself. And while he was tending his sheep, he said, many times I prayed. He wrote this in his confession. Many times I prayed. The love of God and his fear came to me more and more, and my faith was strengthened. My spirit was moved so that in a single day I would say as many as a hundred prayers and almost as many in the night. And this even when I was staying in the woods and on the mountains and I used to get up for prayer before daylight through snow, through frost, through rain. There the Lord opened the sense of my unbelief that I might at last remember my sins and be converted with all my heart to the Lord my God who comforted me as would a father his son. So he comes to faith in Christ while he's working as a slave for this human sacrificing druid chieftain. But through prayer, he comes to faith in Christ. And then one night he has a dream that comes to him and he hears a voice in this dream saying, look, you need to go back to your own country, which was Britain. So he does. He catches a ship and goes back to Britain, is reunited with what was left of his family, Then when he was about 40 years old, he's living back in England in his home country. He had another dream, and this dream called him back to the country of Ireland where he had last been as a slave, very reminiscent of what happened to Paul in Acts 16. This is what he writes, In the depth of the night, I saw a man named Victor Ricus coming as if from Ireland with innumerable letters, and he gave me one, And while I was reading it, I thought I heard the voice of those near the Western Sea call out, please, holy boy, come and walk among us again. That's very similar to the Macedonian vision that Paul had where he saw a man of Macedonia saying, come and help us. And here, uh, Patrick gets this vision, please, holy boy, come and walk among us again. He says, their cry pierced my heart. I could read no more, and so I awoke. And so he returned to Ireland. He confronted the Druids. He converted a lot of the chieftains to Christianity. He used the three-leaf clover to illustrate the Trinity. The Druids tried to kill him, ambush him, and assassinate him nearly a dozen times. He said, daily, I expect murder, fraud, or captivity, but I fear none of these things because of the promises of heaven. So Patrick wound up baptizing 120,000 people, founded 300 churches, and he said this, Patrick the sinner, an unlearned man to be sure, none should ever say that it was my ignorance that accomplished any small thing. It was the gift of God. And then kind of the irony is Irish missionaries, because of his influence, sailed back to Europe and evangelized the heathen hordes which had overrun the Roman Empire. So there was a St. Patrick, and he was indeed a saint. A couple of quick sound bites before we go to the phones, 888-589-8840. We talked last week about this uh, uh, election win of uh, David Jolly in Florida, special election running against a 
a highly favored, high-profile Democrat, outraged him, outspent him. She had a problem. This is the first campaign he'd ever run in his life, lackluster campaigner. She had the money. She had the name recognition. She'd won that district when she ran for governor against Rick Scott in 2010. All the cards were stacked against uh, David Jolly, but he won. And here Mark Levin is on Neil Cavuto on Friday, and he says, look, not only, not only was David Jolly running against the Democratic Party, he was running against the GOP elites. He was running against the Carl Roves and the ruling class Republicans. Let's listen. Last Friday, the, uh, Re the National Republican Congressional Committee and the Speaker's Office and the Republican establishment thought Jolly was going to lose. So they go to their favorite source, the liberal website Politico, and they trash this guy. And they dump all over this guy. And I read from it, and, and they point out that they went to three other Republicans, but they couldn't convince them to run, and they were stuck with Jolly. And when Jolly came out of this January primary, he didn't have any money, he didn't hire the right finance director. And they're laying this out. I mean, a few days before this Tuesday's election, they're going on and on about how his staff was incompetent. They well, we should explain. We said there was a, a motivation for that, that he was trailing in almost all the polls. So it well, looked like he was going to go down to defeat. They, but, thought they obviously had internals, looked like he was going to lose. They right. had a libertarian running. He was running against a well-known, formidable opponent. And uh, they, they said that, that he wouldn't listen to their professional advice. Uh, he didn't hire the right staff. His campaign was unfocused. And... Get a load of this. He was an ingrate because when he was asked twice whether he would support Boehner for speaker, should he be elected, he was noncommittal. And so they just spent four printed pages in Politico trashing this guy. They even called it Keystone Cops operation. And then Cavuto says, look, after he won, didn't they kind of recant on that whole Keystone Cops thing, maybe to win the party's favors, whatever? Here's how Levin responded. Clip two. But didn't Lee later recant on that, uh, maybe to win their party money favor and say he would? Or, or well, what do you he know sent that? out a little tweet and said he would, but that's not my point what he did. Right. My point is what they did to him. They expected him to lose, and so they had their, their whole positioning ready to go, that this was just another Todd Aiken, a, a conservative kook. He didn't handle it right, and it turns out he won. You know why he won? And I had callers call my show from his area. Because conservative groups turned out hugely to turn out the vote at the grassroots level. The fellow wins. Obamacare was the key issue. You know what the second issue was? Amnesty, which they also won't talk about because they want to push that. Well, his opponent, if memory serves me right, right said, had, had, had gotten herself in a pickle by saying what would happen to all of our uh, uh, hotel cleaners and all the rest. So, so, so she might have buried herself there. But in other words, it, it was not all hunky-dory before. But it's hunky-dory now. So what do you make of that? And they welcomed him into the fold, and, and Speaker Boehner swore him in, and all is right with the Republican world. What are you saying? Well, it's not hunky dory, and of course Boehner swore him in. Boehner swears in everybody. Um, well, I don't know. I, I hope Mr. Jolly understands who his friends are and who his friends weren't, but I'm trying to make a point to the American people and the people in my audience that uh, the establishment comes out, Carl Rove has this op-ed today in the Wall Street Journal. I guess he had another one ready to go in case the guy lost, telling us the lessons we can learn from this. Well, the lessons you can learn from this is this. This guy never ran for public office before. They didn't want him. They did everything they could to stop him in the primary. Then they, they trashed him when their polls showed him to be a few points behind. The point is this. If we don't get new Republican leadership in Washington, clean out these consultants, clean out these Republican institutions, and put in some fresh people, new people, solid people who are really concerned about the country and really concerned about winning. This is the sort of sleazy that's going to go on. So that's Mark Levin saying, hey, not only was David Jolly fighting the Democrats, he was fighting the GOP establishment. He says, we've got to get some new leadership in the Republican Party. Well, let's go to Ray. Let's go to the phones. Ray, Tampa Bay, Florida. number is 888-589-8840. Ray in Tampa Bay, Florida. What's on your mind? Hey, Brian. God bless you, man. Thanks Thank so you. much for the, for, for the, for the war that you're, you're, uh, you're waging uh, for, for righteousness sake. Um, I just want to make a comment about the Scott Lively uh, uh, segment. Um, yeah. That was very, very insightful. I had no idea he was running for governor. And um, and it's uh, uh, can you clarify a little bit about that parade and everything? I understand 
that it that, that the homosexual didn't get a chance it was was it a quick parade they didn't get a chance to organize or what well what happened that? there were two different events there one was a one was a debate he was first invited to a debate at Harvard Law School because he was a gubernatorial candidate then the homosexual lobby went ballistic and they disinvited him because they didn't want a homophobic hater like Brian Fisher or Scott Lively to be on their their debate platform <laughs> And then the day of the debate, they changed their mind and invited him to come back. So at the debate, the Harvard Debate Club, he did, or the Harvard Law School, he did go and participate in that debate. Now, yesterday, he marched in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Boston, and the organizers of the Boston Parade would not allow the homosexuals to march in the parade. They wow. said, we're not going to have homosexuals marching in. Wow. I mean, they can come and mar uh, march if they want, but they can't identify themselves as homosexuals. No wow. banners for homosexual groups. Wow. And by the way, that the, the gay lobby tried to force Boston to let homosexual groups march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled nine to nothing. Nine to nothing, the Supreme Court said, if the Boston organizers of the St. Patrick's Day Parade, if they don't want homosexual groups marching in their parade, they have the prerogative to do it. They've got a right to decide who gets in and who gets out of their parade. So the, the gay activists, they... Uh, they tried to, you know, stir up these boycotts. They got a couple of beer companies, like the Guinness Beer Company. Sam Adams got them to pull their sponsorship of the parade, which probably only hurt them because they're not selling their product at the parade. And trust me, if there's any one thing that people at the St. Patrick's Day Parade need to know know how to do, it's to purchase and drink beer. So they probably just hurt themselves with it. And uh, it was unsuccessful. I mean, Scott Lively saying, look, the turnout was huge. I got a lot of very positive response. People saying, you got my vote. None of the other gubernatorial candidates had the gumption to even show up at this thing because the gay lobby was trying to demonize anybody and everybody who showed up, and it was a complete and miserable failure. All right, Ray, listen, I appreciate the call. Thank you uh, for that. You know, a lot of people are unaware of Scott Lively's candidacy for governor, but uh, we'll see what happens. It's a long shot. He admitted it himself, a long shot, but... Uh, as the scripture says, with God, all things are possible. 888-589-8840. Mac, hang on. Albany, Georgia. We'll lead off with your call when we come back after the break. Focal Point, AFR Talk. Stay with us.